Definition. A function f is continuous from the right at a number a if the limit as x approaches a from below of f of x equals f of a. And a function is continuous from the left at a number a if the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals f of a. This is a very lame definition of being continuous on the right and being continuous on the left at a number a. In English, what does this mean? A function is continuous when the function of a equals the limit. But what if the limit from the left and the right aren't the same thing? Well, we call it continuous on the right when the functional value, that's your dot, filled in dot, actually equals the limit from the right. We call it continuous on the left when the functional value actually equal to or connected to the limit from the left. So, and there's one other typo on this thing. You'll discover lots of typos on this, these notes. That's just what we do. But every year they get a little bit better. All right, so here's a, here's a graph here. If f is a function from the, uh, is f, excuse me, is f continuous from the left or the right at the points x equals negative 3 and the other x coordinate where the breaking point is is actually at 1. That's the typo right there. 2, it's, not, it's continuous, so that's great. But uh, here's the deal. Look at it. Look at x equals negative 3. Clearly, it's discontinuous there, but where is the functional value? It is here. Which side is it connected to in terms of limits? It's connected to the limit from the left. So since the limit as x approaches negative 3 from below of f of x actually equals that functional value f of negative 3, we say it is continuous from the left. Does that make sense? So the answer for this one, put a type in left for web work there. All right, what about uh, x equals uh, 1? Not 2, but 1. Well, where's the functional value? It's right here. What is it connected to? It's actually connected to the right half of the graph where you can take the limit as x approaches 1 from the right. Well, so since the limit as x approaches 1 from the plus side of f of x actually equals f of 1, we say it is continuous from the right. We have another definition. What do we call it when a function is not continuous on the left, nor is it continuous on the right? We call it a jump discontinuity. The functional value doesn't connect to the left, nor does it connect to the right. Look at your next example. Show that f of x has a jump discontinuity. So we're kind of defining this term right here. Jump discontinuity at x equals 9 by calculating the limits from the left and the limits from the right at x equals 9. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take the limit as x approaches 9 from below. Clearly, 9 is my breaking part of f of x. I want you to take the limit as x approaches 9 from above of f of x. And I want you to compare it to what exactly is f of 9. So to take the limit as x approaches 9 from the left, which piece of my piecewise function do I get to use? Top, medium, or bottom? Top. 9 from the left means I'm slightly less than 9. And since I'm less than 9, I use this function here. So this will be the limit. Notice the proper notation here. Uh, as x approaches 9 from the left of x squared plus 5x plus 5. And what's your first rule of limits? Plug it in. That'll be 9 squared plus 5 times 9 plus 5. And just make sure I don't screw this up again. Let's see here. 9 squared plus 5 times 9 plus 5, 131. Yep, there it is, 131. What is the limit as x approaches 9 from the right? That means I'm plugging a number slightly bigger than 9. Since I'm bigger than 9, I'll use the bottom function. This will be equal to the limit as x approaches 9 from the right of negative 4x plus 4. First rule of limits is plugging a number. That'll be negative 4 times 9 plus 4. Let's do some math in our head. Negative 4 times 9 is negative 36. Plus 4 is negative 32. So the limit from the left as x approaches 9 is 131. The limit as x approaches 9 from the right is negative 32. By the way, what is f of 9? 
You can nine, x equals nine. That is fourteen, and you can clearly see the functional value is not connected to the limit on the left, nor is it connected to the limit on the right. This is called a jump discontinuity. Does that make sense? Now, theorem. This is getting you guys into the concept of higher mathematics and stuff, but it's something worth thinking about for you guys. It says this, if f and g are continuous functions at a number a, and c is constant, then the following is also continuous at a. Continuous functions have a wonderful algebraic property. Again, waiting to get you guys in those three and 4,000 level math classes. Here's the deal about continuous functions. If f and g are continuous functions at x equals a, then f plus g is a continuous function at x equals a. Uh, f minus g is also a continuous function at a. f times g is a continuous function at a. f divided by g is a continuous function at a, provided that g of a does not equal zero. You can't divide by zero. And a constant times a continuous function, whether it be f or g, is also a continuous function. In other words, Continuous functions have nice algebraic properties. You can add them. The sum of two continuous functions is still a continuous function. You can subtract them. Continuous function minus continuous function is still a continuous function. You can multiply. Continuous function times continuous function is a continuous function. You can divide. Continuous function divided by continuous function. And here's, the, here's the stickler. And that will be a continuous function provided the, the denominator g is is not equal to zero. You do have to worry about dividing by zero there. And when you take a constant times a continuous function, it's still a continuous function. They have wonderful algebraic properties. So you can start creating algebra out of this stuff. Theorem. A polynomial function is continuous everywhere. You know a polynomial function is a function that looks like this. Y equals a sub n, x to the n plus a n minus 1, x to the n minus 1 plus dot 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 plus a zero, where the a sub i's are your constants, and n's have to be positive exponents, positive integer exponents. That makes a polynomial. Okay? A rational function is a function that looks like this. y equals f of x divided by g of x. Polynomial over polynomial is basically what you get for a rational function. And polynomials are continuous everywhere. That's a classic continuous function. However, a rational function is continuous everywhere it's defined. And it's defined everywhere except where g of x is equal to 0. Okay? So these guys create more continuous functions. This one has a little stickler. You've got to worry about the denominator being equal to 0. But this guy, polynomial, is always continuous. You know you're in trouble when they start naming the theorems. This is called the intermediate value theorem. f is a function that is continuous on a closed interval between a and b where f of a does not equal f of b and n is a number such that f of a is less than n which is less than b f of b then there exists a number c such that a is less than c is less than b and f of c equals n well, when you read this thing without the picture, it just kind of blurs out of your head here. So that's why I drew the picture. Here's the deal. F is a continuous function. Notice, I did not lift my pencil from the paper when I drew it. We'll go back to high school with that concept. And it is defined between A and B, including A and including B. So we include A and B. And notice this, when I plot a, there's the point, there's f of a, and I plot b, it's way up here, there's f of b, and the endpoints f of a and f of b are not equal to each other, they're not the same point. And n is a number such that f of a is less than n, which is less than f of b. So pick any n you want to between f of a and f of b. n is arbitrary. What this theorem is telling you is this, when you have a continuous function, you are guaranteed I could project this in backwards, plot him back this way, and plot him down, and there's going to exist. That's why this thing is so important. This is called an existence theorem. You are guaranteed there's going to exist 
at least one C. There may be more, but they're guaranteed to exist at least one C such that C is between A and B. And most important, F of C would actually be equal to the number that you made up, F uh, equal to N. F of C equals N. This is the beauty of a continuous function. Since they're continuous, if I pick any guy in, in between any Y coordinates, I can project them back and get an X that's going to map to him. Discontinuous functions, I can't guarantee that on, but continuous functions, I can. So, here's a web work problem for you. Show that f of x, which is equal to uh, x squared minus x minus 2, has a root on the interval between 1 and 3. You can go, how does this connect back to that other theorem? Well, you first tell me this. What does the word root mean to you guys? What does root mean? Zero. Okay, another word for root is the word zero. That doesn't help many people out. What does zero mean then? What's another word for that? Yeah. What do you call that? Calls it the x-axis, so it's called the x-intercept. So you're right. The root, zero, and x-intercept are all the same thing. And what exactly, as we define it, what's an x-intercept? It is the place that the function crosses the x-axis. And how do you find this guy? The x-intercept is where y, which is equal to f of x, actually equals zero. Right? Just to remind you. Now, I want to show by theorem, that f of x equals x squared minus x minus 2 has a root on the interval between 1 and 3. Well, first off, this is a what? What kind of function is this guy? That's eh, a quadratic, right? Now, we're going to call him a polynomial, which a quadratic is. Uh, it's a polynomial. So it's what? It's continuous. Right? And what is f of 1 equal to? And what is f of 3 equal to? Well, don't hurt yourselves. f of 1 would be 1 squared minus 1 minus 2. 1 squared is 1 minus 1 is 0 minus 2 is negative 2. What is f of 3 equal to? This would be 3 squared minus 3 minus 2. 3 squared is 9 minus 3 is uh, 6 minus 2 is 4. So f of 1 is equal to negative 2, and f of 3 is equal to 4. According to the intermediate value theorem, and we're math people, so don't think too deep when we abbreviate everything. Intermediate value theorem, negative 2 is less than what number, which is less than uh, 4. What's the number between negative 2 and 4 we're interested in called roots, zeros or x-intercepts? zero. This is f of 1, this one is f of 3, and notice zeros between it. Therefore, by the intermediate value theorem, there exists a c in, in the interval between uh, 1 and 3 such that f of c is equal to, what was the number we chose for the n guy here? Zero. And what do you call this guy? You're guaranteed you got a root. That's following the mathematical logic of what the theorem is telling you. If I got a continuous function and I happen to notice that when I plot one point, it's below the x-axis because the, the y-coordinate's negative. I plot a different point and the y-coordinate's positive. And it's continuous function, it's got to cut across that x-axis somewhere. There's got to be a zero, a root, an x-intercept somewhere. Now, here's another web work problem for you guys. Number 15. Now, this one, all you were supposed to do was say f of 1 was negative 2 and f of 3 equals 4. Therefore, since zero is between the two, you have just shown the existence of a, uh, a x intercept or root. Yeah? Uh, for there existing c between yeah. 1 and 3, is that a brace or a parenthesis? 
This is a parenthesis. Look at the theorem. The, the, the endpoints are included on the function, but when you're looking for the C, you don't have equality on this. It may, it's not going to be the endpoints. It's got to be a number in between the two numbers. Okay? Same idea of paying attention to it. This is another web work problem, and it's very lame, and it basically is asking you, do you understand the theorem called the intermediate value theorem? So don't hurt yourselves on this one. Think intermediate value theorem. We just went over it. Here it is. Let f be a continuous function such that f of 1 is less than 0, which is less than f of 9. Then the intermediate value theorem implies that f of x equals 0 on the interval between, not including, a and b. Parenthesis a, comma, b, close parentheses. Give the values of a and b. What's a? Yeah, it's the guy in the parentheses. It's the x coordinates. One. What's b? Yeah, Merry Christmas to web work. It's like three points there. But there it is. You have a web work just like this one. It's understanding the intermediate value theorem. The, 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 the constant's got to be between the x coordinates, one and nine. That's what they Does that make sense? Okay. Section 1.6. Section 1.6 is limits involving infinity. All right. Remember I told you guys in section 1.3. Recall from section 1.3 that the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over x squared does not exist because you can't divide by 0. Well, we're going to go back and fix that and start allowing to have infinity answers. But, since the function kept increasing, we now want more be more descriptive about this. So any value that keeps on increasing is said to approach infinity, and any value that keeps decreasing is going to be said that approaches negative infinity. So we're redefining the limits so that we can actually have infinity and negative infinity answers. So if you watch the awesome pre-section video in section 1.6, I did this exact problem. I plotted some points, very, very close to zero from below and very close to zero from above. And what you'll see is on both sides, when you graph this thing, blow up. It's still the case in our definition that the limit from the left has got to be equal to the limit from the right to exist. But we're allowed to have infinities. Since the limit from the left it blows up and the limit from the right blows up, blows up is going where? Positive infinity. So because they're going to the same direction, we now declare the limit as x approaches uh, 0 of 1 over x squared to not just, no, does not exist. That's too lame. It is actually infinity because they're both going to infinity. They're going to the same thing. However, when you look at this guy, 1 over x, and I'll do this very quickly, when I plot these guys and I get very close to 0, on the left side, you blow down. On the right side of 0, it actually blows up. So, officially, the limit as x approaches 0 from the left of f of x would actually be negative infinity because it goes down. And again, we're allowing to have infinity answers. And the limit as x approaches 0 on the right of f of x is actually equal to positive infinity. Therefore, what is the answer for the limit as x approaches 0 of, in this case, 1 over x? That's my happens to be my function here. Well, again, the same definition. For a limit to exist, the limit from the left has got to equal the limit from the right. And so as long as they're both going up, that'll be positive infinity. If they both go down, that's negative infinity. However, when one side goes down, the other side goes up, they're not going to the same spot. And we still call that what? Does not exist. You can still have a does not exist answer. You've got to go in the same direction. Does that make sense? So that part of the definition still holds. We're just now allowing you to have infinity for your answers. And so let me reiterate this. Your next test, your first test for that matter, will come after section 2.2. You check your syllabus. So when I give you a problem on, on like this or like this from uh, you know 1.3 versus 1.6, which rule are we going to go with? 1.6. 1.6 is more detailed than 1.3 was. So now that we're covering this stuff, you have to know 1.6 information and disregard the answer always being does not exist. You can now have infinity answers. Okay? So, 
little algebra review. Let's talk about isotopes for a second. This is high school stuff. Algebra 2, pre-calculus. Some of you people took something called Math 3. I'm not really sure what the numbers are anymore. But whatever you math class you took in high school, you covered this. Something called vertical isotopes versus horizontal isotopes. Now, definition. Oh, definition. It says this. If f of x is equal to p of x over q of x is a rational function where p of x and q of x have no common factors and n is a zero of q of x, then the line x equals n is a vertical isotope of the function f of x. That is a textbook definition of a vertical isotope. Let's break it down to what you guys remember from high school. How did you guys find vertical isotopes? Perfect. You set the denominator equal to zero and solve. Well, almost. You've got to worry about common factors. So you're going to take that denominator and set it equal to zero and solve it. And typically with these polynomials, you're going to try to factor it. But you've got to make sure you don't have any common factors between p of x and q of x. Because if you do, the common factors don't make vertical isotopes. You know what they make? They make holes in graphs. And there's a difference between a hole in the graph and a vertical isotope. So you've got to, any co common factors cancels. That's the zero over zero mindset. That gives you holes in the graph. But when the, de when the denominator does not a common factor and you set that equal to zero, that will always make a vertical isotope. That's what this theorem is done. Locating horizontal isotopes. Again, stolen right out of your textbook here. Let f of x be equal to p of x over q of x, which is equal to the polynomial. p of x is a sub n x to the m plus a m minus 1 x to the m minus 1 plus dot, 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 all the way down to a 0. q of x is equal b to the m x to the m plus b to the m minus 1 x to the m minus 1 plus dot, 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 all the way down to b 0. Now, the theorem says this. If m, excuse me, if n is less than m, then y equals 0 is the horizontal isotope. The way I taught my college algebra pre-calculus students was this. M and N. Who's M and N? It's the degree of the top numerator versus degree of the denominator, the bottom. So N is equal to the degree of the numerator. We'll just call him T for top. And M is the degree of the B uh, bottom there. With me? When the degree of the top is less than the degree of the bottom, that's what you need to remember. Degree of the top less than degree of the bottom, you're going to get y equals zero is going to be your horizontal isotope. Which means, what's a horizontal isotope? As I, x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, or smaller and smaller and smaller negatively there, this is the line that you're approaching, y equals zero, which would be the x-axis. When the degree of the top, n, is equal to the degree of the bottom, m, when the degree of the top equals the degree of the bottom, then the horizontal isotope is y equals a sub n over b sub n is the horizontal isotope called the ratio of the leading coefficients. Ratio of leading coefficients. The AN over the B, uh, AN over the BM. Okay? And if the degree of the top is bigger than the degree of the bottom, then you have no horizontal isotopes. What you end up having is something called a slant or oblique isotope, depending on which textbook you ever used. Does that make sense? So, in terms of horizontal isotopes, it's all about the degree of the top versus the degree of the bottom. So, here's some examples here. <coughs> For the following rational functions, find the vertical and horizontal isotopes, if any. All right, f of x is equal to 16x squared divided by 4x squared plus 1. First thing you want to do is factor the numerator and factor the denominator and make sure you don't have any common factors. Common factors makes holes in graphs, not vertical isotope stuff. The problem is, you know, 16x squared is pretty much 16 times x times x. That's not really weird on factoring here. The question is, how do you factor 4x squared plus 1? Well, if it was a minus, I would have something called a difference of squares I can factor. But I can't factor a plus. Does that make sense? So this thing doesn't factor. So to figure out the vertical isotopes, <laughs> I can see I have no common factors, so all I really have to do for the vertical isotope is to take the denominator, set it equal to zero, and solve. Help me out. Solve for x on this thing, please. What's your first move? 
Subtract one from both sides, not a problem there. That's gonna give me four X squared equals negative one. What's your next move? Five by four on both sides. That gives me X squared is equal to a negative one fourth. What's your next move? Take the square root of both sides and that's gonna give me X is equal to an efficiency. When you take a square root, don't forget, it's gonna be plus or minus the square root of negative one fourth. What is the square root of negative one fourth? Officially, it's one half i, plus or minus one half i. i being the square root of negative one, the imaginary numbers. It's not a real number. We're interested in real answers in this class. This is real calculus, not complex calculus. So, because of that, you can't take the square root of a negative number. This does not exist, which means there are no VAs, no vertical isomptotes. Does that make sense? What about the horizontal isomptote? Well, what is the degree of the numerator at the top? What's the degree of it? Two. And what is the degree of the denominator, the bottom? Two. And when the degree of the top is equal to the degree of the bottom, the horizontal isomptote ends up becoming y equals what? The ratio of lean coefficients. And the ratio of lean coefficients is 16 over 4. And of course you want to reduce that. What's 16 divided by 4? 4. There it is. Y equals 4. It has a horizontal isomptote, but it does not have a vertical isomptote. Look at the next one. G of X is equal to X plus 8 divided by X squared minus 64. First, find the vertical isomptotes, and second, find the horizontal isomptote. How do I find the vertical isomptote? So the denominator equals zero. Ah, be careful. First, factor them and see if you have any common factors. And this one you actually do. X plus eight is pretty much fixed there. How does X squared minus 64 factor? X minus eight times X plus eight, right? And you'll notice that the X plus eight is what we call a common factor. So here is the real deal. You take your factors, the common factor common factor is the x plus 8. When I set it equal to 0, I get x equals negative 8. But this is not a vertical isomptote. You know what this guy is at x equals negative 8? It is a whole hand graph. The non-common denominator is the x minus 8. You set him equal to zero and get x equals eight. That is the vertical isomptote. And there's a big difference between a whole versus a vertical isomptote. We're after the vertical isomptote. Common factors gives you whole in graphs. Non-common factors of the denominator set equal to zero give you vertical isomptotes. What about the horizontal isomptote? Well, the degree of the top, the numerator is one. The degree of the bottom, the denominator is 2. So when the degree of the top is less than the degree of the bottom, what do we get? Y equals 0 is the horizontal isomptote. That lose you guys anywhere. Take a look at number 5. H of X is equal to X cubed plus 7 divided by 5X minus 2. Well... Can you factor x cubed plus 7? Well, there's something called the sum of cubes formula, but that thing is uh, not worth my time in doing for you guys because I'm looking for common factors to 5x minus 2, and there aren't any, and it's pretty obvious. So, once again, if I clearly see there's no common factors, to go for the vertical isomptote, you do the traditional set the denominator equal to 0. 5x minus 2 set it equal to 0. Solving for x, add 2 and divide by 5, I got 2 fifths. Does that make sense? x equals 2 fifths. For the horizontal isomptote, however, the degree of the top is what? 3. The degree of the bottom, the denominator is 1. And when the degree of the top is bigger than the degree of the bottom, there is no horizontal isomptote. It's right off the theorem here. 
So, before I do the sixth one here, let me emphasize. If I ask you, hey, what's the vertical isomptope? Don't tell me two fifths. It's an equation. The vertical isomptope is x equals two fifths. The horizontal isomptope, don't tell me it's zero. It's an equation. It's y equals zero. X equals or vertical isomptopes, Y equals or horizontal isomptopes when they exist. Okay? So, knowing that, take a look at K of X. K of X is equal to X squared minus 2X divided by 2 minus 3X plus X squared. First thing you should do is clean them up. They messed you up on this one to see if you guys are going to fall into the weird trap of how do you factor 2 minus 3X plus X squared? Well, typically with polynomials, we like to write them in decreasing order because that's how we've done it since the seventh grade. So let's do it. This would be equal to x squared minus 2x divided by x squared minus 3x plus 2. And before I even look for vertical isomptopes, I can clearly see I can factor something out of the numerator and factor something out of the denominator. What can I factor out of the numerator? x, that leaves me with x minus 2. And how does that denominator factor? x squared minus 3x plus 2. x, x, 1 and 2, minus on the 1, minus on the 2. Right? What do you see here? You've got a common factor. The common factor is common factor is x minus 2. I set it equal to 0 and I solve. I get x equals 2. And what is x equal to? Right, it's not a vertical isomptope, it's a holing graph. The vertical isomptope is the non-common factor, which is the x minus 1 factor. Set it equal to 0 and solve, and I get the equation x equals 1 is the vertical isomptope. So if they ask you, what's the vertical isomptope? Don't tell them 2 comma 1 or, no, it's just 1. There's only one of them. 2 is a holing graph. And then last but not least, what is the horizontal isomptote? Well, the degree of the top, the numerator, when you rewrote it was 2. The degree of the denominator, the bottom, is uh, 2. So the horizontal isomptote is y equals the ratio of what we call the leading coefficient. That's why we had to rewrite it. The leading coefficient is actually 1x squared divided by 1x squared. So it's what? 1 over 1, which implies y equals 1 is the horizontal isomptote. Does that make sense? Questions? But this is all algebra review. Let's go back and look at it from a limit perspective. From a limit perspective, the vertical isomptote occurs when the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to either plus or minus infinity and or the limit as x approaches a from the plus side of f of x equals plus or minus infinity. As I do one of these one-sided limits to a, I'm either going to blow up or blow down. Again, I'm either going to get infinity or negative infinity, which is now a legal answer to have. So again, I did some awesome video work on these particular problems. You should go and watch the video in section 1.6. So I'm going to do this problem here. All right, understand this. First rule of limits, plug in a number. So I want to show you what's going to happen when I plug in a number. Again, refl reflecting back to section 1.3 and especially section 1.4. First rule, plug in a number. To take the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 1 divided by 2x minus 4, I'm going to plug in 2. That's going to give me 2 plus 1 divided by 2 times 2 minus 4, which equals 3 divided by 0. In section 1.3, we're done. We say the answer does not exist. But we're not in section 1.3 anymore. We're in section 1.6. Now I got a the classic number divided by 0. So to figure out what's going on here is this. I'm going to take the limit as x approaches 2 from below of x plus 1 over 2x minus 4. And over here, I'm going to take the limit as x approaches 2 from above of x plus 1 over 2x minus 4. The problem is, is when I get really close to this dude, I'm going to get a number divided by 0, which doesn't exist. So when you get that number divided by 0, here's the real deal. 
A number divided by zero is going to give you one of three answers. The answer is either going to be infinity, negative infinity, or does not exist. There's three cases. How do I figure out which one it is? This is when you want to do the T-bar. What number am I approaching? Two from below. What's some number slightly less than two? 1.9 and 1.99. You've got to show a pattern. All you need to do is about two problems. You know the answer is either going to be infinity or negative infinity, one of these one-sided limits. You just got to figure out what direction you're going. And to figure it out, you've got to plug in close and closer. You've got at least two points. You can do three if you want to, but two is good enough. So let's plug it in. 1.9. So 1.9 plus 1 divided by 2 times 1.9 minus 4. And I get negative 14.5. Negative 14.5. Now I'm going to plug in 1.99. So I'm just going to recall it back down and replace the 1.9s and just insert an extra 9 there. So and now it's 1.99 plus 1 divided by 2 times 1.99 minus 4. And I get 149.5. That's good enough. Negative 149.5. This thing's going to 2 from below. What number is this one going? I'm going from negative 14 to negative 149. What's happening to it? It's going towards negative, and the numbers are getting bigger, but negative, officially, they're getting smaller, right? Negative infinity. So I can tell you from my chart, this is equal to <laughs> negative infinity. Does that make sense? Now I need to figure out the limit as x approaches 2 on the plus side of this guy. So once again, I'm going to do my t-bar. But I'm going after 2 from the positive side. That means I'm going to plug in numbers like 2.1 and 2.01. And all you need is a couple of them because you got to show a pattern of getting big and bigger or small and smaller because you know it's got to be either infinity or negative infinity when you get a number divided by zero. So, parentheses 2.1 plus 1 divided by parentheses 2 times 2.1 minus 4 and I get 15.5. Uh, and when I plug in 2.01 and get a little bit closer for x there, that gives me 2.01 plus 1 divided by 2 times 2.01 minus 4, and that gives me 150.5. So as this approaches 2 from the plus side, I'm going from 15 to 150. Where's it going? Infinity. Positive infinity. So the limit as x approaches 2 from the plus side of x plus 1 divided by 2x minus 4 equals positive infinity. Therefore, what is the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 1 divided by 2x minus 4? Does not exist. Why is the answer does not exist? Because the limit from the left is negative infinity. The limit from the right is positive infinity. They're going in a two different directions. So therefore, the full limit doesn't exist. Remember, when you have a number divided by 0, it's one of three answers. The answer is either going to be infinity or negative infinity or does not exist, and this is the way you have to analyze it. And that also, when you get this situation here, that also tells me that x equals 2 is a vertical isomptote. Okay? The next part is this, just to hint you guys on this one, limits at infinity. So this is something new. Right now, there are three cases of limits. First rule limits, plug in a number, get a number, you're done. Second case of limits is the one that you'll get beat to death. It's the plug in a number and get zero divided by zero indeterminate form. You've got to quote unquote do algebra if you can on that thing. Clean that sucker up, cancel somebody out, and then re-put the limit. The third case now is plug in a number and you get a number divided by zero. And then you've got to approach it from both sides doing the T-bar. There's now going to be a fourth limit. We're going to be taking the limit as x approaches positive infinity or negative infinity. This is called, theoretically, how to calculate horizontal isomptotes. As x gets really, really big, positively, or really, really small, negative infinity, what is the value that the function is approaching, if any at all? That's called a horizontal isomptote. It's called the limits of infinity. But we will do that next time. Okay? So, remember, on Friday, we're not having a uh, review day this Friday, but uh, we will start this stuff back on uh, Tuesday, excuse me, Wednesday because of Labor Day.